All right, so now um, we're gonna get to read some of the letters that Chloe's written her sister, Violet. I'm on, the, I'm on page four, middle of the page where the first letter begins. New York City, Saturday, November 9th, 1918. Dear Violet, well, I voted. It was nothing like father warned me. There were no gangs of hoodlums standing at the top of the steps to throw down voters from the opposition party. I did not lose my femininity. I didn't have to drag my skirts through the mud and muck of national politics. My skirts are eight inches from the ground and the muck of national politics turned out not to be that deep this year. There were thousands of women voting and yet New York did not have a Bolshevist revolution. Not yet anyway, it's only been a few days. Did the false armistice happen in Susquehanna too? Thursday, the newsboys were out on the streets hollering that the war was over. I was treating influenza patients on the fifth floor of a tenement house and everybody dashed down the stairs and out into the street cheering and throwing their hats in the air. But then it turned out not to be true, of course. Everyone says the war can't last much longer now. Um, just a little bit of background. This letter is being sent in the midst of World War I. A lot of the countries in Europe have given women the vote, the vote now, you know. Some of them have only given it to women whose sons were killed in the war. That makes me really angry, as if women are only as good as men if their sons die. But the United States doesn't even have that. At least women can vote in New York State now. That makes 16 states, plus the territory of Alaska. Ah, oh, Alaska, speaking of soldiers, how is Stephen doing? I hope you aren't reading the war news to him. I know father always says that that's what he'll want to hear, but somehow that doesn't seem very likely to me. Write if you can, the address is on the envelope. Your loving sister, Chloe. Stephen is their brother, in case you missed that earlier. Violet smiled because the letter sounded so much like Chloe. And Alaska, Chloe had always wanted to go to Alaska. She'd taken out every book the library had about Alaska and she'd drawn Violet a picture of an Eskimo driving in a dog sled. Violet had asked for an igloo too, but Chloe had said the, that the Alaskan Eskimos didn't live in igloos. Violet looked at the envelope. The address was somewhere in New York City, Henry Street. The next letter gave her a jolt. November 20th, 1918. Dear Violet, I can't tell you how sorry I am about Flossie. You know father wouldn't let me in to see you, don't you? I drove up as soon as I heard about it from cousin Helen and was in Susquehanna the next morning. I had to stop in Scranton overnight after the hope chest blew a tire. It's second on the trip and it was too dark to see to change it. Mother wanted to let me in, I think, but father said no and all I could think of was you all alone upstairs in our old bedroom with your thoughts. So notice a couple things. One, something about someone named Flossie. Two, first mention of the title of the book, The Hope Chest. So be thinking about what the hope chest might be. I wish I could call, but even if I had enough money for long distance, father would just hang up. Write to me, all right? I wanna know how you're doing and wear your face mask every time you go out so you don't get the flu. Love, Chloe. Sounds a little similar to our times, doesn't it? Violet felt a sharp twist in her stomach. Reading the letter made it feel as if her best friend Flossie had just died yesterday instead of almost two years ago. It had happened right near where she was sitting now, on the banks of the Susquehanna. She and Flossie were playing Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly was a newspaper reporter who reported the war from the trenches on the Western Front, and Flossie wanted to grow up to be just like her. So that day they were playing that Flossie was Nellie Bly and Violet was a captured German soldier. Only suddenly Flossie had complained of a backache and then she had gotten a nosebleed. And Violet had said, your ears bleeding, Flossie. And by the time she'd helped Flossie home, Flossie was bleeding out of both ears and her nose and couldn't talk. That was the influenza, like getting run over by a steam train, not just sniffles, but blood pouring out of your nose and ears. People didn't understand how the disease could hit that hard, could kill so many people when it was only the flu, except that after 1918, it would never be only the flu again. Violet clenched the letter in her hand and was furious at mother and father. In those awful black days after Flossie died, it would have meant a lot to have Chloe sitting at the foot of her bed again, talking to her and telling her stories. 
She couldn't believe mother and father had sent Chloe away when Violet needed her, just because Chloe was a new woman who wanted to vote and have a job of her own. She was still Chloe. So a lot to unpack here, just about the time that this book is taking place and all the things that are happening. A war, a world war, um, the flu outbreak um, that killed thousands and thousands of people across the world. Um, and then the news that, that Violet's dear friend Flossie had died from the flu two years prior. So that must have been in 1916. So just some things to be thinking about as we're putting all these puzzle pieces together about a new character and a new story. Um, I am ending at the top of page eight. My next video will continue from there.